call the meeting to order. order. Call, yes, thank you. I have, great, will do. I'm calling the meeting to order. Welcome everyone to our April meeting, uh, which is somewhere in cyberspace. Um, let us start with introductions. That will also help us know who's actually here. Um, go ahead, someone. I, I'll start. Eitan Nasred and Longo, chair. Judge Grierson? Yep. From the judiciary? Yep. Oh, Gary Stop and State Police. Monica Just, Weaver, Department of Corrections. Great. I can't hear. Uh, I can't hear Jessica. She was muted or something. I'm I'm Chief Don Stevens. I did mute myself. Sorry about that. Jessica Brown, Chittenden County Public Defender Office. Rebecca Turner, Defender General. David, are you here? That would be no. Um, Sheila Linton, um, Community at Large, Root Social Justice Center, she, her pronouns. Okay, we're going to just get going. Um, I'm sorry this will be rocky because... It just is, but there it is. Um, Hello, hear me? I'm sorry. Hi, this is Susanna Hi. Davis. I'm also on the line. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director, State of Vermont. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the line who has not introduced themselves? Ken Schatz from Department for Children and Families. Great. Thank you, Ken. Anyone else? No. Okay. Um, I have been told David Cher will be here shortly, and after him, Pepper. So that's all I know in terms of people who, who are currently on the line. Um, Anybody else have any announcements to make? Okay. Um, I wanted to start by telling This is David here. Can you hear me? Hi, David. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Great. Um, David Chair is on the lines. I'm sorry for technological difficulties. Uh, one note I wanted to say real quick before you go on. If there are folks who are trying to get on the video, I'm hardly one to talk, given the fact that I haven't been able to make myself heard for the last 10 minutes. But um, if you want to get on the video, you can press the little video icon at the bottom left of your uh, screen, of your app screen, and it'll allow you to join if you uh, want to do so. Okay. There you so, are. Oh, well, isn't that lovely? Um, I wanted to start by telling people about um, testimony that I gave two weeks ago tonight. Um, to hold on, I'm trying to call it up at the same time here. Yes, with the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions. Um, they were curious about two things. First, our report from December of last year, and secondly, our reaction to S-338, the so-called Justice Reinvestment Bill, and you'll recall that we, that was pretty much the focus of our last meeting. Um, I gave them a short version of the exact same presentation that I gave to the Joint Judicial Oversight Committee on 3 December. Luckily, I never throw anything out, and I had copious notes so I could put something together for them. You'll recall that you all empowered 
Rebecca Turner and I to write a letter to various parts of the legislature on S-338 when it became clear that they wanted some direction from us regarding the matter of data co collection. We were going to collect comments from you all based upon our report that we could include in a kind and pleasant letter that would direct their attention towards our work. There weren't many comments from the body, but the world had at that moment lost its collective mind. Um, I think that I only heard from David and Jessica. I don't know. If there were others, I'm sorry. Um, I don't remember at this moment. It's been, as you all know, fairly chaotic. Anyway, the pandemic hit. The legislature wasn't dealing with anything that didn't have to do with state operations and the coronavirus. And that clearly changed relatively recently. Um, the legislature is currently quite clear about wanting to move S-338 forward this session. So then I won't go into the whole drama about how I actually ended up testifying, but I did. And in an odd way, the testimony functioned <laughs> is at, like the letter. Um, although what we have to say might need to go in more directions than merely the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions. Um, they asked a lot about how we thought about a body that organized data collection. You'll remember that was a hallmark in our report. Um, and then they asked a couple of members, asked for greater specificity about this. And I kind of backed off at that moment. And I said that I would have to speak further with the panel. Um, I said I couldn't speak for the panel on that point. That was acknowledged. And I was asked to move us as the panel in that direction. So just so you know, we'll have to do that. Um, there were a couple other matters that came up during my testimony in the questions that followed. They wanted us to liaise with Senator Sears and the Senate Judiciary Committee regarding the RDAP in the data studies. There was discussion of how this body would work in the collection of data for the state legislature. Nothing was firm except for the sense that that would be important. Out of this came a comment that one two-hour meeting a month would likely not suffice going forward at some point in time, that doesn't mean that in May we're going to have eight meetings or anything like that, or even two. I'm just saying that that was raised, and I agreed, given what we're talking about, that, in fact, that may become problematic. Um, some of you know, I mean, it's, it was certainly problematic when we were writing the report, and everyone did Goman's labor, even, I think, with that limitation. Um, so that will happen probably – after the bill becomes law, and that there then is, I guess, the formation of a body to deal with the data as we suggested in the report. Um, the committee suggested that we shouldn't necessarily take the lead in the data collection section of S-338, but that we should join with others in leading. In other words, the committee felt that the RDAP should work with other key entities to work out the makeup of the data oversight group. In the end, um, and most importantly, the RDAP is now clearly enmeshed in S338. Um, it wasn't before, and it will be an important entity that will work towards its facilitation. That was not previously the case, as I said, but it is now. They were very receptive to us and what we have done and also to what we hope to do. So it was a very good thing that we were ready to take on S338 last month and that Ellen Whalen Worse was with us to speak of the bill and the work that had created it. If all works as planned, we might very well need, as I said, to meet more often. And again, don't freak out about that yet since nothing is yet a done deal. Um, I'm gonna be working with David to create contact with Senator Sears with whom it seems we will have a great deal to do in facilitating S-338. This is a very important bill to him and to others. Um, as the bill states, we will work with at least the Sentencing Commission. 
I will begin to look into this. I was starting to do that, but then the virus came for a visit. Um, they were, last I knew, going to rework some language in the bill, and some of this language has to do with making us an integral part of this legislation. As I say, there's a lot of movement towards getting this passed the session, so we are actually, as far as I can figure out, right where we need to be in spite of the efforts of the virus. And that's all I have to say about that. Any questions? Comments? Anything? Wow. Okay. I mean, it may be that you're all on mute, but... <laughs> okay. Let's just move forward then. Um... As I say, that's all I wanted to bring up um, regarding that. The next section of the meeting that I thought and David thought and a lot of people thought would be important was a discussion of recent legislation and executive orders that sort of that have certainly come about as a result of the pandemic, but have very clearly impacts in the area of racial disparities. So I asked four of you to speak from your agencies about work that you've been doing. It's not to be obviously very formal, just about seven minutes. And I think what we ought to do, and we can talk about this now, um, Chief Stevens agreed with this, that we ought to let everybody present. And then after it's all out there, then open us up for discussion. Does that sound good to everyone? Chime in. Works for me. Works for me too. Thumbs up. Yes. Let's just go with yes. <laughs> I think that sounds lovely. Um, so, David, can you give us a general legislative overview, please, as the agenda requests? Certainly. Um, a few things I want to note. One is that a lot of the folks who've really been heavily involved in various, I should say, potential, mostly potential legislation, are lined up to speak after me, and I will defer to them on the meat of some of those bills that they've been working on. Um, one of the aspects of this response has really been that a lot of it has, in fact, been an administrative response, and that's something that I think will probably be touched on um, by other speakers as well, by other presenters, I should say, as well. Uh, certainly, a couple of things that our office has done, I'll just mention briefly because I, I think it's generally relevant, if not precisely on the topic of legislation. But we, as folks may know, have been involved in figuring out the enforcement aspect of the governor's executive orders, really with a heavy emphasis on education, not a, a punitive response trying to uh, encourage voluntary compliance. Um, and we did step in to sort of set a statewide policy around uh, enforcement matters to make sure that that was the emphasis everywhere and also to make sure that we had a um, uh, response that was uniform and coordinated and fair across the state. The um, We'd also issued a guidance with respect to pretrial detention issues, and that guidance, I really must say, was driven by the practices that had all, that have largely been put in place by other entities around the state. I do want to um, give credit where it's due and, and, and let folks know that this, this really wasn't so much uh, an invention of our office as it was a reflection of what has been happening in state's attorney's offices and the Department of Corrections and so forth. Um, and that guidance really, again, is just a heavy emphasis on reducing wherever possible pretrial detentions, and, and in fact, the numbers bear out, the data bears out that there's been a very significant drop in pretrial detentions. Uh, and uh, I know Monica Weaver can speak more to that. On the legislative front, um, one of the major bills that's moving forward is numbered S-114. It used to be something else. It has become a vehicle for uh, 
changes primarily to judicial procedural matters. Uh, Judge Grierson, I know, is lined up to speak, and I want to defer to him on this bill as well because he's really been the primary driver on it. Uh, as some folks on this call may know, the judiciary issued something called Administrative Order 49, and that was a document that changes the operations for the courts to allow for all the public safety measures that are necessary in this time. Uh, but not everything can be changed by uh, simply by judicial order. And S-114 has become a vehicle that deals with some of the other aspects of what needs to be changed. And again, I'll, uh, I think it'd be, Judge Grierson will be the better person for uh, this group to hear from on the details of S-114. Uh, but it does have a, a number of changes. Um, some changes that had been considered and that people on this call may have heard about uh, are, are not in there. I, I will note that the potential change, which included um, a, a uh, sentence review after 90 days, which is not currently allowable, uh, had been considered in the Senate version, is not in the uh, version as it passed the Senate, in part because that was going to be a, a complex and controversial lift, and so that didn't go forward. Uh, but Judge Gers can, can talk a little bit about what remains in that bill. Um, with respect to non-purely responsive to the emergency bills, we do have one that is moving forward. And uh, this group um, should be hopefully happy to hear that it is the, <laughs> the major bill that we had identified as wanting to focus on and make some changes to, and that is S338, which is the, the Justice Reinvestment Bill. Uh, and this was the bill that we talked about extensively at our last meeting, and there was, I think, a sense of the group that we wanted to be sure that we were involved at the very least in the data aspects of that bill, in other words, in the uh, parts of that bill that say, hey, we are going to build a better system. We need to um, have the right people in the room to do that. And I think a very reasonable ask, as, as the one ask that Aton made, was that this group be a part of that, since that was such a major aspect of the report that we issued to the legislature. And that's certainly something that our office supported after Aton spoke on it. We testified the following day. It was I uh, testified on behalf of the office, not just about this aspect of the bill, about the bill more broadly, but I certainly made sure to emphasize that we supported that ask to have this body be a part of that study. And, and I will also report that Senator Sears has been apprised of that. Uh, he has no issue with it. Uh, so I do expect that to move forward. And with that, I will turn it over to um, the next person on the agenda. And that would be Monica Weber. Hi, Monica. Hi, Hi how's Hi. everybody doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to, I'm getting a little feedback, so I'm going to just make an adjustment here. Before I start. Okay. That's better. Well, I think I could talk for a lot longer than seven minutes. I'm not 100% sure what people want to um, hear from the Department of Corrections at this point. Um, I will start with S338. Aton, I did listen to your testimony um, the day you oh. were in front of corrections and institutions. Yep. I know you can't tell uh, no. how many people are watching on YouTube. But I was there. Uh, and then uh, the next day, uh, uh, we also, the department testified on S338, uh, as David said he did for the Attorney General's office. And I supported the comments that you made, um, adding RDAP to, I think it's section 19, um, yes. and the overall comments you made. So I just wanted to let everyone know that because they're sort of taking a poll um, for some people. Um, and I let them know that I was the department representative to this panel. Um, so, yeah, S S338 is taking up a fair amount of uh, time for the department in the legislature. Um, you know, we've been testifying on that 
prior to COVID-19 and continuing to offer testimony as, as we can in this new version of um, being a witness on YouTube uh, and Zoom. Uh, I know that there have been a lot of other bills that have been introduced and other work um, and calls um, from all parts of the state um, for the Department of Corrections um, to release people. Um, as David mentioned, our population has uh, reduced dramatically in, in the past month, partly because of the um, detention population declining. So that has a lot to do with um, courts, state's attorneys, law enforcement, um, all that effort in the pretrial world. And um, the sentence population has also reduced uh, in large part from the Department of Corrections really um, either looking at people who are eligible for release and, and doing our due diligence, um, ensuring you know public safety um, and releasing people where we can. And also natural releases that happen. People are, are maxing out of their time. They're reaching their minimum release date so they're released on furlough, which is typically what happens. Uh, so the combination of those efforts has um, reduced the incarcerated population to, uh, you know, just a little over 1,400 people today, which is um, quite astonishing. Yeah. Um, it, you know, there's been a, a significant yeah. change in department operations. There's just way more than I can possibly go into in, in seven minutes. But, our, you know, our, our focus from the beginning when we really first started to prepare for this, which was, I don't, I don't know, late January, early February has been on the safety and security of the people that we serve, our inmate population, our staff, um, and, and on public safety uh, and trying to sort of balance all, all of those things. So the changes that we have um, made are, are made with all of those pieces uh, in mind. And I understand that not everyone is um, pleased with uh, all the responses that, that we've made. Um, I do understand that there's some discussion on a, on a bill. I think it's some proposed language that might be coming up tomorrow around the compassionate release um, section of statute that might add some language that allows the commissioner um, to release people um, if there's a possibility of them potentially being infected uh, with the virus while they're incarcerated. Um, I'm not 100% sure what all the details are of that bill. Um, David, you may know more about it than I do, or, or Pepper may know. Um, I just saw something about it this afternoon. Um, I think those are the main points I want to make, um, and I'll wait and, and people have questions that they want to ask afterwards. Great. Thank you. Um, let's move right along. Judge Grierson, the judiciary, please. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Can you hear me? Absolutely. So well, let me start with um, the Supreme Court um, issued what is called an administrative order on March, effective March 17th, which effectively reduced um, all of the schedules in the courts down to a list of emergency matters, uh, the listed emergency matters, which included, for instance, um, juvenile uh, proceedings, taking children into custody, uh, arraignments, uh, bail reviews, bail proceedings, um, emergency motions to modify parent-child contact, either children in DCF custody or in the domestic docket. So they, they made a list of items uh, or dockets. Um, RFAs, relief from abuse orders, can still be heard. But it was a very specific list of matters that could be addressed on an emergency basis only. As our staffs are cut probably more than half, um, and there's a much uh, decreased judicial presence in the courts because of those reduced hearing schedules. 
Um, in addition to those matters that are listed, this administrative order provides that if someone seeks an emergency uh, or files an emergency motion on something that is not uh, included in that list, uh, that request would be referred to me for a decision, uh, decision not on the merits of whatever the motion is, but a, the decision by me to allow uh, the hearing to go ahead. There have been numerous amendments to that um, administrative order. It remains in effect now. It was just extended last week until the end of May. So essentially all court proceedings uh, have been put on hold other than these emergency matters at this point until the end of May, which obviously impacts everybody in this meeting. Um, stepping away from that uh, order, um, David and others mentioned uh, S-114, um, which is a bill uh, now that uh, speaks to uh, judicial procedures. The genesis for this bill was probably about a week or 10 days into the uh, emergency uh, order that the court had imposed, and it was a reaction to uh, issues that we were seeing in the court uh, that I felt and others uh, felt needed to be addressed in some fashion. Uh, the, the content of this order, contents of it, would only be effective uh, during the emergency emergency period. It includes, among other things, um, issues um, and provisions that will allow certain legal documents, deeds, wills, and so forth, um, to be signed um, remotely, uh, either by video or um, with a video recording. Um, there's also a provision that in lieu of the use of a notary public, which is required for many uh, documents, many pleadings that are filed with court, it includes a provision that allows uh, those documents to be filed under with what is called a, um, a declaration or uh, a swearing as to the accuracy of the document as opposed to appearing before a notary. A notary public, obviously, uh, in, in someone having to appear before a notary uh, creates uh, problems with social distancing and just the availability of folks that were willing to do that. Uh, there are other pieces that are more specifically related to the um, criminal juvenile docket. Um, and so I'll go to those now. They include uh, an amendment to Rule 43, the Rules of Criminal Procedure, which involves the, uh, the uh, presence of the defendant at various proceedings um, in the criminal process. We have asked for an amendment to that rule that would allow a defendant to appear appear by video. They're appearing by video for many proceedings now. Uh, under the current rules, uh, defendants can appear for um, arraignment proceedings if they consent uh, to those proceedings. Uh, and this amendment would allow them to consent to literally any other appearance uh, in court via video um, after con uh, consulting with an attorney. The importance of that is, is simply this. Since the pandemic uh, and the emergency uh, order has gone into effect, every facility, correctional facility in the state now is operational with video. Um, it had been the case before the uh, pandemic uh, hit, but probably only one or two uh, facilities and one or two courts were using that process. And less, um, someone has different information, I think since this emergency period started, transports from facilities to courts have dropped to, I would have to say, almost zero. In other words, all defendants for criminal proceedings um, are appearing by video with the consent of the defendant as well as uh, counsel. Um, and that has made a significant difference in what we're able to do and this rule would allow us uh, to continue to do that. And uh, a number of other changes were asked for and they include timelines, uh, for instance, for review of bail, uh, review of conditions of release. Um, and they were, we asked to have those extended uh, not to 
take longer to do them, but with reduced staffs and reduced uh, judicial resources in the courts, we just can't meet those deadlines. So it's more of a practical consideration that um, we ask to extend the timeline timelines uh, to conduct those proceedings. Um, there are also uh, extensions of rules relating to uh, DWI offenses, which involves suspending licenses. And this bill allows for, in its present form, and, and it's still going through committee at this point, um, that we could continue with prosecution of DUI offenses, but the licenses, license, driver's licenses would not be suspended until we could have uh, certain hearings that wouldn't occur until after the emergency period. This bill right now has gone through the Senate, is now in the House. There may or may not be changes um, to that. I think those are the highlights of the bill uh, as they relate to criminal process, criminal proceedings. We've extended the statute of limitations. That was one other one. So if someone has a civil claim that needs to be filed during the emergency period, uh, we've extended the time to file those lawsuits. Um, and again, it all relates to, you know, the attorney who's supposed to be filing a claim on behalf of a client may not be uh, well enough to do so. So there are a lot of reasons for that. I, I, two other things I guess I'd like to highlight, and then I'll turn it over to whoever next. Um, I mentioned that one of the emergency procedures we can and we should be doing are bail review proceedings. Obviously, the conditions in the facilities themselves and the um, impact of the COVID-19 uh, virus have had a significant impact on the uh, incarcerated population. So we have a number of motions that have been filed all over the state. I think it's up to at least 50 motions for review of bail or reconsideration of sentence. I won't go into the details of the legalities involved in those proceedings, but the volume was such, um, and just today there were two additional filings, two separate filings that involved maybe 50, 50 additional um, incarcerated individuals. So we were, we're pushing probably close to 100 individuals. And because of the reduced resources, what I have done um, is to assign three judges to consolidate these hearings um, and hopefully resolve uh, as many as we can. But those hearings are tentatively scheduled to uh, take place next week. I've been in touch with John Campbell and, and Matt Valerio um, to discuss how we would um, handle all of those proceedings. But in short, I have assigned uh, three judges to handle those particular motions um, in a consolidated way. We're able to do that in no small part to the use of video because very few attorneys, whether they're state's attorneys or defense attorneys, are physically present in courtrooms anymore. So this process and the use of video and obviously telephone uh, allow us to um, have one judge in a remote location handling cases from other counties. Um, I think I've gone way over my seven minutes, Aton, but uh, that's... That, that, that way, that way. <laughs> um, so those those are some of the certainly the bigger issues that um, uh, that we were confronting every day. And I guess I'll leave it with this piece. Uh, I was on uh, a hearing this afternoon and along with Ken. Um, the other big issue in the courts um, in, involves um, modification of parent child contact, um, both situations of families that are involved with the DCF and uh, domestic partners. Uh, either folks going through divorce or parentage cases, and, and that is becoming um, a significant, uh, represents a sig significant, significant number of motions have been filed in those courts. So, um, and those are because they're emergencies, uh, we still conduct those hearings the best we can, usually by one or more people participating by phone if they don't want to come to court. Um, so that's what I've been doing. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Next, 
would be Ken Schatz. That's me. I'm ready. Commissioner DCF. <laughs> Hi, folks. Hi. So I'll say maybe I'll start by segueing with the um, uh, discussion that uh, Judge Gershon just started with respect to uh, certainly a major issue prompted by COVID-19 is the issue of in-person visitation between parents and children in DCF custody. It's incredibly challenging. It's a terrible conundrum. On the one hand, wanting to support parent-child contact. On the other hand, based on the governor's order and commissioner of health advice, uh, any in-person contact poses the risk of spreading the virus. And that's compounded when you have foster parents, family <laughs> workers, and other folks having to be involved in that process. So it's really difficult. As uh, Judge Gerson indicated, the uh, legislature is talking about it, not sure where they will go for the time being. It's a case-by-case -case, uh, approach in terms of going to court, although I should add that by and large, the overwhelming majority of families involved with DCF have agreed to remote visitation by telephone or video conferencing, and certainly we're appreciative of that. But it is an incredibly challenging issue, to be sure. So the the um, pending legislation, um, I think uh, David sent something out a while ago, and S-232 is really the main bill that um, we have been involved in and following. That is really a uh, bill that talks about implementing the expansion of juvenile justice jurisdiction, which is really uh, the raise the age jurisdiction, which was Act 201 previously passed. Um, we're still on a course of implementing 18-year-olds being involved in the juvenile justice system as opposed to the adult system as of July 1st. This bill 232, for the most part, is really just technical changes to implement that. Um, so I, uh, we're certainly still moving forward. It's certainly relevant uh, to the discussion in terms of this panel in that we're certainly aware that uh, youth of color are overrepresented in our delinquency system. And as we look to uh, revamping our approach to juvenile justice, we have that in mind and hopefully can successfully address it to reduce that overrepresentation. I'll be candid, our attention has been so focused on dealing with the pandemic, we have not done the, the level of planning uh, that I wish we could at this point in time. Be that as it may, we're still at it. The, it is also relevant to mention that what's been added to 232 is discussion of the uh, Department for Children and Families proposal to close Woodside. And that is, of course, also very relevant to this panel in that we've talked about in the past that it is one of the key areas of um, racial disparity in the justice system in terms of overrepresentation of youth of color in that facility. Um, Clearly, from my perspective, the proposal to close Woodside is a uh, reflection of the reduced number of youth in our delinquent system as a whole. Good news also that the youth involved in the justice system uh, are not committing uh, the extent of violent offenses that, that was true in the past. So that's all really good. As I look at the calendar, I realize it's been about a year since we've had more than five youth um, in a locked facility in Vermont, which again is a very positive statement. But the legislature having some hesitation on our proposal to close Woodside has asked that we uh, provide them with some alternative plans. Again, we're working on those. The COVID-19 has definitely put a crimp in our ability to do that, but we're still at it. They uh, also want to look at funding for other uh, resources for youth, including mental health issues, which I also think is worth mentioning here, that they do have been made aware that, and this is partly was our testimony, that really the issue of priority with respect to youth is not so much violent behavior as it is youth with significant mental health issues. 
and the lack of available services and programs to meet their needs. And so the legislature did respond by asking the agency human services to develop a plan to meet those needs. So assuming this bill passes, we'll work on that. Um, and so the bill did get sent to the appropriations committee, um, which uh, again, their uh, efforts are somewhat distracted by COVID-19, but assuming for the sake of discussion, everybody does want the raise the age um, jurisdiction changes to occur as of July 1st, I remain hopeful that the legislature will find a way um, to actually pass this legislation, despite the fact that they're not gathering in person. So I'll stop there and um, glad to answer questions as they come up. And then with that, let's, I wanted to open this up to a general discussion. Um, I, you've all heard the presentations. I hope you have made a few notes about things that may concern you. I was thinking most specifically about, oh, I get the phrase wrong all the time, high impact, high discretion contact points. You'll remember that. Rebecca's got the term down. She knows it. Um, that we've actually, that was such a big part of our report were where are these moments in the system, in the systems, plural, where there was a lot of discretion and therefore the possibility for the entrance of not, you know, certainly explicit bias, but also in some ways more insidiously implicit bias. So I was hoping that we could start a discussion around that. Those of you who are particularly sensitive to this, I would think you would have probably a lot of questions and concerns. Um, there were, I will tell you, when I was putting this together, I got some pushback, not from our panel, people sort of going, well, it's an emergency, you know, things just have to happen. And I certainly understand that, but I also think that this is also the time at which, uh, shall we say, the Constitution is of greatest importance. Um, it's, as you well know, not just for when it's okay and when everybody's fine. It's also for a time of stress. So I'm hoping that the discussion can kind of go in the direction of let's look at, given these decisions that have been made in these various departments, where are some of those points of contact that may evolve this, uh, bias, those points being things on which this panel is focused. Period. Hey, Tom. Yes. Hey, Tom, this Rebecca. is Rebecca. I, I just wanted to clarify what you're asking. Are you asking us to, to explore points of discretionary decision making during this COVID uh, moment that everyone is speaking about or more or yes. broadly? Well, more broadly in general, but certainly around this COVID moment. I, that's why I was talking in the agenda about the impacts of the pandemic about, upon legislation that we already knew was out there, but then also around stuff that has happened, particularly in response to the pandemic. Um, then, then hearing that, would the rest of the panel um, object if Perhaps I and and maybe and hopefully Jess Brown could just talk for five minutes to bring the defendant's perspective and what we're seeing to the table because we just heard the government stakeholders talk about it from the judiciary and the DOC and DCF, uh, AGO. But what you have not heard is what the COVID experience is like for the Defender General's office and the attorneys within. And allow me to apologize for that. So I'll take, love that as a, oh, as a, I'll take that as a green light. And Jess Brown, um, are you there? I am. I just unmuted myself and turned my video back on. All right. So I'm on phone, <laughs> and I'm going to try to not um, get too upset. But I just want to share that my experience since we've last talked the past three or four weeks, I get up at 6 or 7, and I start going on COVID emergency consults and calls. Um, motion filing, drafting, training, uh, emails, and it doesn't end until the end of the day. Yep. It is a very thick, scary experience as an attorney, but 
We are fielding constant calls, ultimately from very scared clients and their families. And these are folks that I'm talking about either just being charged and worried that they're about to be brought in, but particularly for these purposes, our clients who are in jail. So whether they're, they're still presumed innocent because of pre-conviction or their post-conviction, post-sentencing sitting in jails, all of them are very scared. And what we know is that what is what we see in the rest of the country, you guys are seeing the news, uh, Rikers County in Illinois, we have had our own reality hit with last week's numbers in the jails going. I don't know if Monica talked about the numbers in here, but I think the current positive numbers, I think we just got one more uh, confirmed positive in the facility today, although I don't know what facility it is, but we're up to 28. Is that right, Monica? Um, in any case. No, I'm sorry. Her. I was on, no, I was on mute. I can answer, I can answer that question. Um, oh, sure. So in total, and I think I just want to be clear about this because we are putting this information on our website about the number of inmates who have tested positive. In total, we've had 33 inmates test positive. Um, that they're not all incarcerated. Some of them have been released. Um, and so we're just reporting on how many have been tested positive overall um, and not on how many are currently incarcerated on our um, web page. It's, it's information that we have, but. But you are bringing, you are dividing it up based on inmates and staff. And, and one Correct. of the challenges we have had, um, and, and to share to the panel what it's like to be an attorney representing these folks, is how desperate we are to communicate with these folks. Um, the, it is really hard to get through on the attorney lines. Once uh, we, we've learned that this smaller group, but a significant group that went from basically no tested to one to then 28 or 27 or however number now, uh, because the, the facility in Northwest was tested and those results came back, revealing what we all feared, which is that COVID has been present, just undetected, unconfirmed, because there wasn't any testing going on. But the scramble for us has been then reaching these folks, and they've been moved to another facility in St. J, where they're containing them, and and granted the logistics and the setup to get contact has been delayed and we it is unclear how uh how these folks are being cared for uh, as we know the severity of covid uh, experiences vary dramatically based on people's underlying conditions we also know that our client base the demographics of our clients are not the general population so those average numbers we see on the outside including morbidity down to 2.5 percent in the community wide is much higher we expect to be much higher in the facilities so from our perspective it's a race against the clock to prevent anyone from dying in the jail and right. i finish each day totally exhausted and feeling like it's not enough just wanted to share that from uh, the defender general's perspective just one glimpse i don't know if jess you have anything else to share Sure. I will say this, um, and it doesn't really go to racial disparities or anything like that. Um, and maybe I think Pepper is on this call now. I think I saw his little icon. Um, and so maybe he can speak to this as well. But I'll say is that my experience is that uh, the A, that this is being addressed in the criminal system is wildly different depending on what county we're talking about. I practice in Chittenden County, um, where our state's attorney, um, you know, basically instructed all law enforcement agencies uh, to, you know, cite people out into June to not uh, – take people into custody unless absolutely necessary, like people who are being charged with domestic assault are being taken into custody, um, but, you know, and are having arraignments, as Judge Pearson indicated, um, and are largely being released. Um, she also, uh, I mean, we have spent first month basically um, 
dismissing a lot of cases that are really old that had old arrest warrants so that nobody is being arrested unnecessarily and being taken into custody. Um, she is doing a lot to make sure to either get people out of custody who are in custody or to avoid taking people into custody unnecessarily. Um, and I don't think that that's happening in many other counties, at least to the degree that it's happening in Chittenden County. And, and like I said, perhaps Pepper can speak to that more. Um, so that's why it's sort of imperative for, uh, for the judiciary or the legislature to, to make some decisions that more broadly help get more people out of jail. Um, you know, we're talking about the numbers of inmates who have tested positive. Um, some uh, employees of the Department of Corrections have also tested positive, and these are people who are going out into the community every day. Um, so, you know, it's in all of our interests to get as many people out of jail as possible, in my opinion, um, and to avoid unnecessarily incarcerating people right now. Um, so, you know, beyond that, I don't have much to add, but I do think that uh, it's important to uh, note that different counties and different state's attorney's offices are approaching this very differently. <clears throat> Is there any? I am, as I said before, sorry that I missed that. I don't, it's been kind of crazy. Um, I would like if anybody else who's got something that they need to add in here that I did not include in the agenda to do so, please. Hi. Uh, Eitan, if you don't mind, I would just like to respond briefly um, from the state's attorney's perspective, just talking about what we've been doing on our end. Muted. Uh, am I muted? No. No. Okay. All right. Well, so since the very first case um, of COVID-19 um, was identified in Vermont, um, the state's attorney started developing through its executive committee um, a list of protocols for all of the offices. Of course, we don't have the ability to control all of the offices, but um, through by or uh, twice a week check-ins, we have been following up and making sure that all of these protocols have been followed. Um, so I'll just walk through them quickly. Um, I've talked about them in a few of the committee the committee hearings already, but um, all 14 states attorneys offices are following these exact protocols. So there are um, non, new nonviolent offenses are all being cited to a date six to eight weeks out at a minimum June 15th. This includes violations of conditions of release that do not directly impact public safety. Um, we reviewed all of the current outstanding citations and pushed all of those dates back into June. Um, we are continuing to flash site and seek um, to hold without um, as appropriate for listed violent offenses um, and violations of conditions of release that directly impact public safety. Um, this would include um, harassment of victims, issues like that. Um, I think Sarah George may have taken, that's the Chittenden County State's Attorney, may have taken the lead on this proposal, but now all state's attorneys have done this, which is we're reviewing all active arrest warrants, and we've actively sought to quash ones where the public safety, the public health concerns outweigh the public safety interest. Um, from the very beginning of this crisis, I sent out a list of all of the pretrial detainees, excluding people held without bail and the federal detainees, um, to the state's attorneys divided by their county. They've reviewed every single pretrial detainee and have made recommendations to either strike bail or modify conditions to allow for release. Um, as I think was mentioned earlier, our detainee level is right around 300, it might be lower than 300, maybe Monica has the most up-to-date information on that, but that's something that we haven't seen in a decade. Um, it's been hovering right around 400 for at least a decade, and so that's just, um, I mean, that's not just our state's attorneys, that's the incredible work of the Defense Council, 
identifying people uh, that maybe we've missed and DOC doing what, whatever they can to identify people that can be released. Um, we've been resolving pending cases for time served when appropriate. Uh, we've now just started, I mean, we have not just started, but we started out kind of with lower level offenders of incarcerated people. And now we're moving on to um, the entire incarcerated population for people that might be safely released. Um, and also, as uh, Judge Grierson just noted, um, there are a huge number of motions to reconsider bail, reconsider conditions of release for pretrial detainees and also to resentence incarcerated individuals. And so we are dealing with those. On, I mean, we deal with them on an individual basis. They're being consolidated, but we're reviewing each one to see um, if there's uh, instances where we can resolve them first before uh, contesting them. So, you know, as Monica mentioned, I think it's worth noting that the baseline data, kind of pre-COVID baseline data for the incarcerated population that DOC is using is kind of February 24th of this year. The, the inmate population, the incarcerated population on that date in state was 1,671. Um, as of today, I think I heard uh, earlier today that it's 1,411. That's a decrease of 260 people. Um, and again, we certainly are not taking credit as state's attorneys for that. Um, it's been a collaborative effort of everyone in the criminal justice system coming together, moving as many people out safely as possible. Of course, a lot of resources in the community are also not available at this time. I know the domestic abuse um, programs that meet in group settings have all uh, stopped meeting. Um, you know, there's always gonna be housing issues um, for people coming out of incarceration. And we're trying to just let DOC do its work on that end um, to help people with successful reentry into the community. Okay. Let us, let's go to discussion. It is 7.10 and I, I think there's a lot here that needs to come up, actually. Um, one of my concerns, just listening right now, is that the story from government stakeholders and what I'm hearing from the people who represent defendants is not, it's never the same experience, certainly. I understand that, but I'm a little concerned that the difference is great enough that I would, I guess, start to wonder about our mandate, what we as a panel need to do about this, how we address it, how we define it, and I'm just going to let it there. For right now. Eitan, I have a couple of questions if I may have the floor. Please. Um, with all these changes happening, I heard Judge uh, Grierson say that they're making some Supreme Court uh, decisions and orders and the legislators are making um, a lot of changes. So my question is, what are the ones that are permanent and the ones that are temporary? The ones that are temporary, do we want to try to influence to keep any of those things to have the flexibility to have them in the future as a, in the toolbox uh, that might help uh, in this situation? I'd hate to the, the temporary ones that to expire, and they may be very useful in the future, and we don't want it to take another pandemic to make them reactivated again. So I didn't know if there's a way to look at the things that might expire and have some influence uh, that would be a positive uh, things to give more flexibility. So I didn't know what the answer is to that because I'm not involved in all this stuff. So um, I'll try. Somebody else can chime in. Um, my understanding is that with most of the legislation I've been involved in, uh, it's S114 as well as there's another bill. I don't think I did mention there's a separate bill that talks about uh, imposing a stay on eviction proceedings and mortgage foreclosures. But my understanding is on all of these bills, um, they're being passed as what's referred to as session law. I'll let David uh, explain what that is. 
Um, but essentially, once the emergency is gone, these are going to expire. Um, that's not to say that some of the um, uh, changes that are in there shouldn't be discussed and perhaps become permanent, but it may be that that the benefit, or if you will, or the value of these some of these proceedings uh, will be demonstrated during the course of this emergency, so it may be easier to get people to agree to new procedures once the emergency is over, once they've seen them in place. But I, my understanding is the legislation will end when the emergency ends. But others may have other information on that. Anyone else? Hello, David. Uh, I can I can chime in too. I mean, oh. some of this. Oh, sorry. Um, some of the things that are part of the emergency judiciary package are not necessarily things that you want to extend beyond the emergency. For instance, right now, if a um, if a person who's incarcerated uh, wants to review their pretrial detained, I should say, wants to review their conditions. They can do so. They have a hearing within 48 hours. As Judge Grierson noted, they don't. The courts don't have the staff right now to keep up with that uh, permanently. I mean, during this crisis. Uh, so it's not necessary. So the the bill contemplates relaxing that um, that mandatory 48 hour time frame. It's not necessarily something that you want permanently in place. Um, you know, these a lot of these measures deal specifically with the reality on the ground um, and, you know, staying eviction proceedings. Is that really something that should extend beyond in, in a an emergency? Or do you want to kind of go back to kind of a normal course of business once the emergency has been lifted? Okay. Yeah, I think I think my question was focused on on the good part that we do want to keep in place. Um, do we have a role in making sure to keep track of that? So when this is over, or how do we? How do we? What is our role to try to say, look, this was a great benefit to people of color, or the, or to the process to allow flexibility, and be able to compile those and and maybe go back and push these later. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out where our role might be to kind of get the stuff we want um, that's that's working. Um, that's that's what I was really aiming. Next, chime in. Okay, I, that to me that's really critical. I when this came up, there were certain members of the public who are sort of community stakeholders in various minority communities who expressed to me concern that some of this stuff exactly cheaped on what would be coming up that's good, that ought to be extended. And as you were saying, Pepper, what are things that are just here to manage a crisis? And what I personally, as the chair thought was important, was that we at least start a conversation about this and try to define what our role as a panel should be. What do we do with that if we find things that are problematic? Do we write some kind of memorandum that we submit somewhere? I don't know. You, you know, David, you know more about this than I do. But I mean, what do we do? What do we define at this moment as being problematic? I feel, felt like this is a good time to start this discussion. I'm not sure when else we would have, but it seems important to me. It seems to align with our mandate. Somebody else fill the airwaves. I'll say this from a defense attorney perspective. We're in a, an emergency, and we are, um, I'm glad to say that we're letting a lot of people out of jail. We have let a significant number of people out of jail. I, I'd say Rebecca and I would probably say not enough, but we have, I, I mean, I don't want to diminish um, the fact that a number of people have been, have been released. 
but it can't help but raise the question of why those people were in jail in the first place, right? And so when we ask that and we look at it broadly, like then when we start to look at that from um, the perspective of the mandate of this committee, um, you know, it, it, I mean, I don't think anyone's doing a real breakdown right now of um, numbers of people that are being released, for example, based on race. You know, that's not anyone's sort of primary concern. But I think that the broader questions of, like, why are we detaining people in custody pretrial, um, you know, certainly is a question that is relevant to this committee in terms of our mandate to look at disproportionate treatment of people of color. Rebecca, do you have anything that you would want to add right at this juncture? Sure, I, I was just about to jump in. I think, um, Don, the, the point I think that's really important that we've been making before all this happened, but specific to COVID, because we didn't really talk about how race is implicated here or how I see or we are seeing race disparities playing out during this COVID crisis, and certainly the numbers. We're not tracking enough numbers or any numbers to, to know. What we do know is what's being reported in the press, right? And folks have probably seen the reporting the Times and elsewhere about the difference in morbidity rates uh, if you're black or Hispanic, right? Um, we know that that people who report things and maybe identical things, some could be taken more seriously or not so seriously based on the race. We just know this uh, in terms of all the implicit racial bias stuff that we talked about. How does that get ex exacerbated in the COVID emergency context uh, should, and we've been advocating this for this before COVID, that is injecting race as an explicit consideration in the legal process, whatever stage we're at, right? And to not neutralize racial issues from the legal analysis period sort of my governing theme throughout. How does that play into a bail review analysis when you've got not just any inmate, but a particular, and it's always a particularized uh, analysis of who should be released, right, in COVID. We look at not just a man, but a black man or a Hispanic man or a Native American man and understand what that means in terms of access to health care, right, or how much underlying health conditions can be particularly exacerbated and can make that person particularly vulnerable. How do we understand that that person who expresses symptoms of COVID inside the jail, who's getting to see the medical providers, who's not? Uh, we know that that, and we've been report, hearing reports from our clients, some have been hiding COVID on the inside for fear that they're going to be put in the hole, uh, segregation, so taken out of general population, effectively punished for showing signs of COVID. Uh, this worries is worrisome on a lot of levels in terms of containment and not you know, not encouraging the spread of COVID uh, in the other facilities. But how does this play out in terms of punishment generally dis dis uh, with disparate results based on race on the inside? We don't know, but certainly, Don and, and the others, like, what can we learn and take away? It seems to me that hey, race is always a factor in these and, and, and that we should not turn a blind eye to race in these, in, in any any opportunity that we we have when we're making and considering a legal analysis as to the individual person before the judge or the uh, corrections officer or the prosecutor or the defense attorney in terms of making calls. Right. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Susanna Davis. I just wanted to chime in very quickly on this topic because uh, I wanted to let you know that. Someone, someone else is thinking about this, uh, about quantifying and measuring and analyzing how many, who we're letting out of uh, incarceration facilities in Vermont. So I wanted to let you know that at the beginning of April, it was April 3rd, I had a conversation with Jim Baker. And at this point, I mean, the news cycle is like six hour increments these days. So April 3rd is a lifetime ago and Monica or someone else might have fresher information than I do, but the reason that I had spoken to Jim was because 
I was concerned about what were the criteria we were using to determine who gets released based on COVID-19, reason being that nationally um, there is the increasing use of an assessment tool called Pattern Assessment Tool, which has a lot of bias built into it because it's an algorithm that relies on inputs from other stages of the justice system, which, as we know, already have bias built into them. So I, I called Jaren and he spoke, uh, Vermont does not use the pattern assessment tool. He was unable at the time of the call to tell me what exactly we do use, but he did inform me that it's a combination of factors, including the person's history of risk, the use of the offense, uh, information related to the victim, et cetera. He also, uh, I, I also asked what was the racial breakdown of folks who were being released for COVID-19 purposes. And he was unable to tell me at the time, but said that he did pose this question to the data folks on his team and that his assessment was that it appeared to be something that they had not previously given consideration to, thinking about bias in those terms. And he informed me that his vision is to make much broader changes at DOC that would include uh, creating, well, I'm, I'm reminded that this is being recorded and I don't want to make promises on other people's behalf, um, but bro broader changes that would uh, model some of our other law enforcement at the state level in terms of focus on equity. So again, if any of you might have information that's a little fresher than I do, but I did want to let you know that yes, someone else at the state is, is looking at this and it would be great to have this information right the heck now uh, because lives are at risk. But I want you to know that at the very, very least, um, if you can't get it now, then I will continue to try to chase this info down uh, after dust settles and capacity gets Okay. Thank you. Hey, hey Tom, can um, yes. you hear me? I can. Okay, great. I'm on the video. Can people see me? Because um, through the computer, um, people weren't able to hear I, me. I can't see you, but I hear you very clearly. Okay, great. Um, I actually just had like a couple of comments, but I actually just had some clarifying questions. I want to make sure I understand some of the information that was presented. And it's by right. um, various people who talked. So whoever feels like they can answer these questions, if they could, would be really great. So I think Pepper said um, something about normal and about returning to normal. And um, I just wanted to say I really, really appreciate um, Jessica's and Rebecca's comments because mm -hmm. I don't want to return to normal. Um, I understand that we are responding in a way to this pandemic, but I would like to create a new normal because the normal wasn't working for anyone, including the populations of brown and black people that we are talking about. So when we talk about returning to normal, I would like us to um, maybe think about what that really means and if normal was really working for us, which I don't think it was or we wouldn't be on this panel in the first place. Um, and the reality to the system is, is that it really has been harming and killing people all along. So the reality is I agree that I wish there was more people out of jail and that I, I concur with what Jessica and Rebecca are saying is, why are these people in jail in the first place? And how are we actually documenting and understanding um, how racial disparities are playing out um, for this COVID pandemic within the systems that we're speaking about? And I don't think we have the documentation and I don't feel as though our conversation really started with um, looking at this from the racial disparities lens that we're all tasked to do. Um, the questions that I have are um, a few questions around what people had said, oh, just for clarification. Um, I believe it was um, Monica, you mentioned, might have mentioned a compassion release. or um, And I was just wondering, if it allowed the commissioner to release folks if there is a potential to get the virus? I think that's what I heard. So I just wanted to understand if that, if I heard that correctly and for you to elaborate on that briefly so I can understand if I heard correctly. Well, that's I my first ask, question. Yeah, I might ask Pepper to elaborate on it a little bit more, but I understand that there is some language that's being introduced that changes the current compassionate release statute. 
Um, there's a lot of people who are who are saying that the department should release people under that statute. The statute is pretty clear um, and has some limitations. And so I think there's been some suggestions for people to um, add language to it. Pepper, is that is that accurate? Are you the right person to really talk about the language that's being proposed? Um, <clears throat> So um, a couple of the state's attorneys have um, felt that, uh, you know, the basis for a lot of these motions to resentence uh, folks is based upon um, their susceptibility or, or pre-existing health conditions um, and their susceptibility to towards greater morbidity because of COVID-19. And so a couple of state's attorneys have suggested that, um, you know, the underlying factors that led to their sentence have not changed. Really what happened, what, is, what has changed is they can't be in a, an incarcerated uh, setting any longer. And the current medical furlough statutes um, have some limitations to them about who qualifies. And so um, I don't think that the legislation is actually ready for, it's, it's been, sent to a couple of legislators who have shown some interest in it, but I actually don't know if it's really ready. Um, you know, there's all sorts of considerations um, and, and due process concerns that involve victims' rights um, and with, the, um, with the proposal, and, and I think it needs a little bit more vetting um, before it goes live. That would be my perspective on it, but um, I actually haven't seen the final drafts or any, or any drafts, really. Just, kind of more conceptualized uh, kind of yeah. a liberalization, well, I guess, of, of medical furlough. Yeah, we just, we just heard a minute about the conversation. Sorry, Cecilia. <laughs> so this is a current statute that you wanted to make amended language to with regards to the pandemic? Yes. Okay. Were you going to say something, Monica? Uh, no, I I was just going to follow up on something oh. different. Well, go ahead. Well, no, I don't think she was done with her question. Ah. Um, the next question I had was around um, Judge Garrison. I think you mentioned emergency motions and that people can um, – I think you were talking about there being like 100 emergency motions that go specifically to you that you have the discretion um, to address or not. And could you just give an example again of what those emergency motions are um, so I can have a, a little bit understanding? It sounds like that – those emergency motions only going to you up until that May 15th date within that sort of timeline or if – could you just clarify a little bit more what you were saying around that? Uh, hundred motions have not come to me. I, the hundred, the number of hundred I was using were the number of individuals as of today, and this is just a, an estimate, I'm not sure of the exact number, of these motions for bail review and or Senate's reconsideration. They're separate. And, uh, they're separate and apart from my authority under the uh, so-called administrative directive. These are all motions filed by individuals that I've assigned three judges to hear. Um, the the discretion that I have under the administrative order um, only relates to matters that are not listed for emergencies that come to me to decide whether they should be heard. I've only had perhaps a half a dozen of those um, in the last month. So they're two separate, two separate items. One of the bail review motions, if I can use that term, and that's what I was referring to as perhaps 100 motions involving 100 individuals, I should put it that way. Does that clarify it, or did I confuse it more? No, I think that clarifies. Thank you, Judge Garrison. Appreciate that. Yep, you're welcome. Um, that leads me to the next question, which I think might be for Ken. Um, you were talking about um, something around, oh, I think it was S-232, and around 18-year-olds being um, involved in the system, and you were talking about Woodside, and you were talking about 
um, something about the 18-year-old involved, and I didn't quite understand or catch what you were really trying to say there. Um, could you explain what you were talking about with the 18-year-old and them being in the system and then relating that to Woodside? Could you clarify what you were saying? Sure. So the, two years ago, the legislature passed a, a bill known as Act 201 that raised the age of juvenile court jurisdiction, historically youth up to the age of 17 primarily were uh, adjudicated in family court, 18 and over, youth who commit uh, a criminal offense are prosecuted in adult court. The raise the age jurisdiction changes that so that beginning July 1st, 2020, 18-year-olds who commit an offense uh, not including the Big 12 offenses, uh, will be charged in family court, not adult court, so there will be confidential proceedings. Two years from then, 19-year-olds will be charged in family court, not adult court. So S-232 makes some technical changes to Act 201 to simply um, make sure that we implement that raise the age jurisdiction successfully. It doesn't change the policy uh, of Act 201. The reference to Woodside was simply uh, a provision that was added to Act 201 to uh, address the DCF budget proposal, which proposes to close Woodside. And what uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee did was add to S-232 language requiring a plan for alternative placements for youth in the delinquency system, and also to require the agency to develop a plan to address the mental health issues of young offenders. Is that a helpful summary? Yes, that's great. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. I've just got a couple of more questions. I think this one might be for Pepper. Um, oh, it was a question of what conditions are people having um, when um, when people are released, um, I wasn't clear to me what the follow-up is. I'm, like, really pleased to hear, I think you said 1671, there's about 260 less people in the prison system right now. Y yes, I think that's great. And I think it's unfortunate that it takes a pandemic that we believe will impact us all and not just the prison system for us to act in this way. And I want to say that because even though this is great that we have 260 people less in the prison system. I acknowledge that there's a reason for that. And in my belief, a part of that reason is, is because we've realized how those impact people impact us out here. And so I'd like to continue to take a look at that. But my question is, is around the follow-up. If these people have been released, is there a need for follow-up? Were they released because there isn't really a need for follow-up? Or are they going on a furlough? Or are they going on with conditions? Or is it just they're done? And it's only the people who can be done and not supervised or have extra supports when they get released, or is it sort of a spectrum of all of those things potentially? Um, great question. Yes, it's absolutely a spectrum of all of them, depending on what the situation is. Um, Pre-trial detainees, um, they're either being held without bail um, because they've committed a violent offense, the evidence of guilt is great, and, no con and a judge has determined that no combination of conditions of release can adequately protect the public. Um, and yet uh, we're having state's attorneys review some of those hold without bails. Um, the people that are being detained for lack of bail, as in bail was imposed and they can't, they can't afford it, um, we're seeing state's attorneys strike bail um, in certain circumstances. Um, and then those people will be released into the community awaiting their trial on certain conditions, um, like they check in if they change residence um, or they are released to a responsible adult, for instance. Um, for the people that, there's a good number of people that DOC is releasing on furlough. Um, those people will be subject to the same kind of constrictions or, or check-ins um, as for, uh, that are typical of furlough. Um, uh, some people are just being straight up resentenced. Um, state's attorneys are stipulating to be to just say, 
you know what, you're, you're, you've, whatever sentence we were going to get, we're going to just say you've gotten time served for your pretrial detention right now. So we're going to agree to a plea deal that gets you out today with not, with no other, uh, outstanding obligations. So it is the entire spectrum, yes. And maybe this is the same or similar question, but, um, how do we, how do we know when it's successful reentry? Are there any during this pandemic temporarily? Or are there any other systems set up? I know that Ken was talking about Woodside closing and there needing to be a mechanism set up for those youth and other things. Are with us releasing so many people out of um, this particular system, what is, how do, how can we be recessful for reentry? And is there anything that has specifically been put in place or funding to help with, um, with that? So the reentry plan is usually developed by Department of Corrections, and it is, I would say, that um, it is probably the best money that we can spend in the state. Um, I mean, maybe not the best money. There's other competing alternatives, um, but it certainly, I was on, uh, I was watching um, Department of Corrections testify on justice reinvestment um, very recently, which includes a $2 million investment in reentry programs and housing and, and services. And um, I think uh, uh, Dale Crook from DOC um, suggested that people with kind of more serious offenses do better on reentry if they have a good reentry plan than people with kind of less risk of recidivism that have a bad reentry plan. So that just goes to show that um, the transition from the incarcerated sen uh, setting into the community, getting that right is essential. And, um, uh, you know, I don't know, because it's mostly on the Department of Corrections side, um, what services have are shutting down because of COVID-19. I know I've heard from some state's attorneys that the sober housing in their communities are not taking new intakes. Um, and so, you know, that's very, stressful for places like DOC when you're trying to um, place individuals back into the community safely. And, um, you know, I don't know if, Monica, you have anything you'd like to add on, on the kind of reentry programming or, or services that are available or maybe not available because of the pandemic um, and what we can do to support reentry. Well, I do think that the, um, the housing is really critical. I mean, that's been discussed. Uh, for many years, and it's it's a big part of the um, S338, um, well, part of the justice reinvestment model. It's not in S338 now, that um, appropriation for transitional housing. They took that out. They're trying to figure out how to put that in some other um, bill. Um, we ha we're working really closely with all of the transitional housing providers because, you know, some of them are completely funded by the Department of Corrections. Other um, organizations are, um, you know, funded through their city or they're part of state government. They're part of community justice centers. They're also dealing with, you know, maybe uh, their own issues with staff or being able to, you know, keep their houses operating. And so we're working really hard with them to make sure that all of the beds that uh, we contract for are available to people. But, you know, releasing people um, without housing, as Tepper was saying, has in the past when we've studied it, particularly people who really need um, some structured place to live has, has turned out to be problematic. Um, they end up returning to incarceration at greater rates than people who don't have a stable home. So in this particular time, it's really important that we have those housing providers um, available, and um, we're working with them every day to make sure that's happening. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Pepper. I just have one more question, and it's for Ken. I'm just wondering on the DCF level um, with parent-child contact and visitation, um, knowing that um, I personally work with a lot of parents who um, are impacted by DCF and have their children in custody and know a lot of parents have lost visitation and some of the telecommunication has not happened or is not happening in what a timely manner. Has there been motions or complaints um, that you've received from loss of um, parent-child contact and 
um, how are how are you as a department, if so, handling that? So we have had, um, I think, 12 to 15 motions filed throughout the state related to parent-child visitation and COVID-19. Um, and so, frankly, those are dealt with case by case. Some of them have been filed by DCF to limit in-person parent-child visitation. Others have been filed by parents uh, asking for in-person visitation. So they've been um, adjudicated individually. Um, with respect to the first part of your question, clearly if people uh, are having trouble implementing um, telephone conversation or video conferencing, they should feel free to contact either the district office director or for that matter, me or Christine Johnson, the deputy commissioner here in our central office, and we will certainly look into the matter. We are definitely aware of the limitations involved by remote contact and want to do the best we can to enable families to make that happen. And just an extension of that question, I don't know if there's any um, shift in policy or things that have shifted because of the difference between in-person and sort of either calls or video calls and understanding how important it is for parents to be physically connected to their kids and the difference between, oh, we had a two-hour visit, now they're saying the kids can only last 15 minutes on a phone call. Is there, um, whose discretion is that at? And is there any policies that have been created to kind of align with, to try to keep things as um, consistent as they were, as if they were in physical contact? I think we're actually working very hard at that, to try to recognize on the one hand the difference. It's not the same. We all know that. And so we have to try to figure out how to adjust during, you know, this pandemic. And we're doing the best we can. I think that we have encouraged um, uh, our staff to use, um, when we can, have available mental health counselors, multidisciplinary teams to try to address specific issues. But honestly, there's no simple answer. We're definitely cognizant that remote visitation is simply not the same as in person. And I think we're all doing the best we can to try to adjust to those circumstances. Thank you, Ken. That's it, Aton. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, I want to work in the time that we have left towards the possibility of sort of an action plan if, in fact, we feel like one needs to happen. Um, hey, Tom, I, Monica, though, yes, can I, I'm sorry. Can I just make, it's, it's Monica. Can I just comment on something else that came up earlier just briefly? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I couldn't hear Susanna very well, um, but I picked up a little bit on um, some of what you were saying. And um, I, I want people to know that while right now it's hard to, for me to tell you exactly all of the information you want to know about releases and breaking it down the way um, people are looking or asking for it. It is something that we're trying very, very hard to do in the, in the midst of also sort of managing everything that's going on at the correctional facilities. Um, so it's not something that we're avoiding. It's not something that we don't think is important. It's just not something we've been able to um, published just yet. Right. Hey, and I just think it's important for people yeah, to know that, know that. Chief, was that you? Yes, I had just one quick comment, and then I just wanted to ask, uh, well, this is probably for uh, Pepper and Monica and uh, Zana, is that uh, one thing that's really scary, at least here, is uh, because of the COVID-19 is, is civil liberties versus safety. Because I'll give you an example, like Harbor Place, they built a fence around that transitional housing to keep people in, not to keep people out. Um, so I just, we, we should make sure the poor and disadvantaged as well as not just uh, people of color, but it's kind of nervous when they when they start building fences to keep people in. 
um, that kind of disturbs me a little bit. But anyway, that's I just wanted to make that we need to start. We need to keep our eye on that too, especially with the transitional housing that Pepper and those guys were talking about when they release people. Okay. Thank you. Um, my concern, what again, being who I am here, is trying to get us to something on which we can act. And it feels to me that there is a really good range here of both praises and complaints in terms of the responses. There's also here a fair amount of fear about what does this mean, given that we now have this change. Um, I guess my question now, I have an idea, but I don't know. I want to hear what other people say. Kind of make this quick because we got 12 minutes. Where do we want to go with this? Because there are plenty of places to go. Anybody got some ideas? Because I do. Okay, I'm going to throw out my idea. <laughs> some of you aren't going to like it, but I think I'll make it. I'm going to try to make this as easy as possible. I think we can't figure out an action right now. I think we don't know. We just had an audition of what's going on. And we sort of did this in a kind of clearinghouse fashion. But I feel like there's more to dig here. And I would love to see from all of the stakeholders, like a half page of bullet points about what's working and what's not. Really that simple. That basic, that preschool that I can look at and I can compile and get back out to you so we can look at very specific things and make some decisions about perhaps where we want to put our energy, where we don't want to put our energy, what we should do. What does that energy even look like? Does it look like some kind of memorandum? I'm throwing this out here for an for a discussion. Hello. It's very quiet. Does that see? Okay. Was that a dumb idea? Let's go there. <laughs> My People can't that. work with silence. <laughs> okay. Aton, Aton, it's Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Oh, I'll fill the silence with a with a question. Did, can you just say what you were hoping for us to do bullet points on again? Complaints and praises to all of the responses or some of the responses that we've heard in the last couple hours to the pandemic in terms of their impact on the high-impact discretionary points that we have been looking at. Got it. Do we have enough data, Anton, to really do that? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think we do. I think what I'm hoping for is sort of impressions right now. We can worry about the data later. If there's not data, then we know where we're at. But at the moment, we're floating. Hey, Tom, when you say data, are you specifically, when I, when I hear data, what I'm specifically thinking of is when we, when they said that there was 260 people who released, I want to know how many of those people are brown and black people, native people. I want to know right. how many of those people are poor. Is that what we're talking about? Because again, we don't, we're talking about how we're responding in the midst of a pandemic. We're not, I'm not hearing how we're responding to the midst of a pandemic within racial disparity. That's not what this, that's not what I heard this conversation um, start as. I hear that's where we're going towards and where we're asking for, but that's not where I heard this start from. So, to me, well, if I, that's the I, data I, that I, we're looking for, then that's again confusing. Of the next steps is the yeah. I would <laughs> counter that the discussion may be symptomatic of something.
if we don't have the data and we're having this discussion, that's interesting. We should know that. So, for example, for the 260 people that were released, does anybody know the um, demographics of those people? Sheila, this is Monica. That's that's what I told you we're working on right now. I mean, I think um, hopefully you all understand that we're 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 trying very hard to develop right. reports that we did that we didn't have previous to this. So we're trying to look at things in ways that we haven't looked at it before, so we can provide that information and and continue to do the things that we're we're working on. So. Um, we don't we don't have it right now, but it is something that we are working on getting and providing to the public. And then I would say that if someone wrote a paragraph saying, my God, we have no data on this and we were just discussing this for two hours, that would be revealing. That would help us make some decisions about where to go. Perhaps we really need to spend our time focusing on S338 given that it really has a lot, at least in Section 19, to do with data collection, and we're already on that. Um, I just think that this has been preliminary, and it was great for that, but I think we need to take it further, and I don't want to wait a full month to do that. That's why I'm saying complaints, praises. Focus on this discussion, what you've heard, what you've taken notes on, and let's go from there. This is Jessica. Can I add one thing? Perhaps um, the people who have spoken about what their various agencies are doing could um, also sort of do bullet points of just to summarize what their agencies are doing um, so that you know, those could, I mean, or, well, I suppose it will be in the minutes. Is David, are you taking minutes of this meeting? Is someone taking minutes? Um, I just feel like it would be helpful to have that information um, gathered somewhere about what the different agencies are, are doing um, to it, it, how the different agencies are responding to the pandemic so right. that, um we can then sort of say, okay, I see that DOC is doing X, Y, and Z, but I feel like this is also missing and we should be looking at this. Right. That makes sense? That makes perfect sense. It's integral. Anybody else? Uh, this is David. Um, I think this is the idea is very good. I, I agree with um, Jessica's add on to it as well. And I would just say maybe we shouldn't view it completely as a one side versus the other side. Uh, you know, one side's going to okay. say what they've done and the other side's going to say what they want to see done, but rather um, uh, the folks who have been part of on the government side of responding uh, should also talk about, I, you know, ideas for the future, brainstorming where the high impact, high discretion points uh, have been impacted and what could be done differently and just have more of a, um, you know, pe people doing both, gener both revealing knowledge and generating ideas all around. I agree. And I did not mean to frame it as a battle of any type, but just like we that we should all be brainstorming and starting from a point of information about what different agencies are doing and then brainstorming ideas of what we could be doing more and also how we can be viewing this and responding to this, as Sheila keeps pointing out, from a perspective of, in terms of this panel, making sure that there are not disparities, like let's just say in how we're responding to this pandemic, that we are not further extending disparities in how people of color, native indigenous people are being treated versus non-native indigen uh, indigenous people of color. So if this is going to go forward, I want, I want two things. One is I want to make a deadline. And secondly, I'll compile it. 
I will compile it and turn – shut up, David. And then I will turn it around and get it out to everybody. But I think – I don't know how the rest of you are feeling. I feel like this is really productive as a preliminary step. And I feel like it's the next thing to do. It's not like the grand gesture. We're not ready to make a grand gesture. As Sheila would point out, we don't have the data. So. Can I just say one more thing before you do your, your which, where you're coming to this wrap up I can see? Um, yes. How dare I you. Wa- <laughs> <laughs> you know how I roll. Um, so yes, we don't have the data and we do. Like, keeping it real with all of you, it's like we right. don't have the specific data of the coming out of the pandemic, but we all know what's up. We all know what's going on. So let's operate and let's operate as like we know what's going on and that we know, as Rebecca said earlier, that race is always an issue. There's always going to be disparities. And this is going to play out in the pandemic as we're seeing in the media across the nation. So we already know this exists. So even right. though we don't have the concrete data and I'm not um, badgering you, Monica, I understand that getting that out is like a lot harder than said than done. So I get that. And I want us to also operate knowing that we know what's up. We know that there are disparities, even if the data isn't, we don't have the data yet, or the data isn't even necessarily showing that because there's a lot of loopholes in that data. Something that I don't know if it's appropriate for this, but moving forward, and so feel free to lean back on me, but when Ken really brought up Woodside, and Woodside, I think, saying that a lot of um, youth of color had been um, had resided there and disproportionately there was a lot of youth of color there and then how people coming out with mental health. Like, we know that an underlining belly of why um, many people actually end up incarcerated is because of mental health or because of the lack of receiving appropriate mental health services. At least that's my belief, and I think there's data and some studies around that. And so I'm really curious in terms of next steps with, I don't know, not just looking at Woodside, but looking at that as an example of systemically, how are we putting into place mental health services that actually meet the needs of um, indigenous and people of color? How are we actually doing that? Because when they come out or when we're creating out those other resources that will have to be done for Woodside, or when we're talking about people just entering into the system, all the different ways a huge component is mental health. And then externally, being in a predominantly white state, most of you might know that there are not very many um, practitioners in that field of color, period. And then on top of that, how um, those people of color are receiving that care or lack thereof is a huge issue. So systemically, I'm feeling as though mental health is a huge component in all of this, in the disparities that we know about and that we're seeing and that are going to continue to come out of this particular discussion of the pandemic. And I would like that to be somewhere in the focus of us moving forward with Next Step. Great. Thank you. So I'm dreading this, but it feels like we need a vote. And I have no idea how to do this. I mean, I can't see anybody. I, um, David, help me. You're like a lawyer. Do something. I would propose that uh, if anybody um, has an objection to the proposal, as Aton has stated it, um, and, and Jessica has refined it, um, that we that they should speak up. Uh, and if there are no objections, we can consider it a unanimous um, uh, acceptance of that proposal. And then I'll tell you something else. Yes. So all – I won't know who you are, so it's really lovely. Who objects? How many objections? Okay. Well, then. So what I'm going to suggest – This isn't long. It doesn't need to be long. I'm going to suggest that by close of business a week from this Friday, which is the 24th, you submit just this short little bit of bullet points to me. All right? Just send them to me. I'll make sense out of them after that. So by close of business on the 24th of April, which gives you roughly, a, what, 
10 days. That work? Anybody object? I'm just going to express, you know, concern about timing, but we'll certainly do my best. Great. That's all I can hope for. Well, then, that's our action thing. All right? Good. I'm glad everyone's on board. Uh, I think we're at the point of making a motion to, I would say, drive home, but I don't know. Whatever you all do. Somebody want to do that? I'll motion to adjourn. Anybody second it? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstention. Motion's carried. We are done. I will see you all on the, I believe, 12th of May. That'll be our next uh, telemeeting, but I'll certainly be in touch long before that. Thank you all. Thank you.